Welcome back to the Marvelous Old World. My name is Matthew Smith. Thank you for joining me for part three of our exploration of the history of Port Towns in Washington. And I have to apologize for having uh, taken so long to get back to this project. And so I appreciate your patience. So without further ado, we are going to get right back into our exploration of Port Townsend's very strange history. Now, I've been saving the best for the last because if you've seen part one and part two, you'll know already that a lot of the history just does not add up. And what we are going to look at now are some of the magnificent and massive structures throughout Port Townsend. For such a small town in such a remote place, they have some of the most unbelievably exquisite and ornate and truly marvelous uh, structures. What we have here to start with is the Jefferson County Courthouse. Now, we can see here that uh, the architecture was attributed to Willis Ritchie, who, if you saw my previous videos on Seattle's uh, equally bizarre history, you'll know, you'll remember the name of Willis Ritchie. So what this brochure says is that the red bricks were brought all the way from St. Louis, which is worth pausing and considering because there was no railroad coming to Port Townsend. And so they would have had to have been brought from St. Louis somewhere and then brought up by water, brought up by ship. I, I honestly, I looked at a map and I don't really quite know how they would have gotten enough bricks from St. Louis uh, to the Olympic Peninsula in 1890. But here we are. And it also says that there was 786 tons of sandstone brought down from Alaska. That's one and a half million pounds of sandstone. And keep in mind that uh, the elevation of this courthouse, like many of the buildings we're about to look at, is it's about 200 feet above sea level. So not only did they have to get it to the port, they also had to drag it uphill to the building sites. Now in the bell tower of the Jefferson County Courthouse, which incredibly is still intact, you have this exquisite clock mechanism of solid brass which, again, according to this brochure, legend has it that the bell was pulled across the plains and the clock mechanism was shipped around the horn. What horn? Uh, uh, South America. Uh, that's quite a ways to go, but that it came from Boston. So there you have it. The bell is still intact and it's still being wound. And one other thing I wanted to mention is that somewhere in here in this brochure, it talks about... In addition to the building itself, in the basement, there was $17,000 allocated for the jail. Again, this is 1890, 1892. It says that the jail was located in the south ha half of the basement. Now, I'm confused right off the bat with this because we looked at the city hall building earlier in part two, and the basement of the city hall is a dungeon-like jail. So why in this early period when there's 4,000, 4,500 people in town, do you have <laughs> do you have these massive buildings with multiple jails? So I kind of put that back to the historians of Port Townsend. If anybody is interested in taking that up, uh, it is one of many incredible mysteries. Now here is uh, just further views of this really glorious building. Uh, the, the detailing in this structure is absolutely exquisite. And here it is today. So you can really get a sense of every corner, every arch, every lintel, every doorway is considered. Now we have 1,890. XC would be 90. So this is saying 1890. Um, 4,500 people lived in Port Townsend. And again, please go back and look at part, parts one and part two to see what else they were building in Port Townsend with so few people. Well, folks were busy fishing and homesteading and farming and doing everything else you have to do to create a new town. I mean, 
this looks like cloth bunting you know this stone work is just so unbelievably detailed you know go try it <laughs> grab a few bricks from your favorite box store and line them up mix up some mortar and try to try to run a straight line see how you do and then do it over 140 feet tall with bell tower mechanisms that's going to last through the centuries it's a very strange mermaid type motif up here uh, looks a little Starbucky. not sure what that's about now you see these carvings in the capitals also in the in seattle's pioneer square i've seen these in denver it seems to be a very common motif for some reason and then there's a debate about whether these are carved or poured cast uh either way doesn't matter to me this is fine craftsmanship and really hard to pull off yeah i'll just let this speak for itself and it's almost like it's just gratuitous levels of exquisiteness and beauty there's detail where you there they'd be forgiven for not adding detail no one would have noticed if this wasn't here no one would have looked at this column that didn't need to be there either and said well how come they didn't detail out the base but they did and there it is and it's absolutely absolutely gorgeous and um i applaud them whoever did this whoever's responsible for it again you know here's our kind of green man looking fella holding up the window having a good old time it's got some secrets for sure let me tell you something about our friend the architect willis ritchie now you'll recall again jeffrey oxner who wrote the book on richard sony and architecture in seattle called distant corner I referenced that in an earlier video on Seattle. There's a quote in a, another book that he wrote called The Biography of Willis A. Ritchie, Public Architecture in Washington, where he says, in the absence of any records from Ritchie's office or surviving family papers, the entirety of Ritchie's career cannot be reconstructed. So here again, we have the case of the phantom architect, just like Elmer Fisher before, and other architects I've mentioned in earlier videos, time and again, we have architects from this period who have no traceable past and no uh, traceable records of the work that they did. So, you know, going back to the um, boosterism, where the record of what was built and by whom, according to Oxner's book on Richardsonian architecture in Seattle, Boosterism comes directly from newspaper accounts promoting their city to the world at large. So without any official records, what we know of these architects and the architecture of this time, once again, comes from newspaper reports. Newspapers which are often owned by the very town's fathers who are said to have founded these cities and inspired or directly built themselves the buildings that we're studying. So, Speaking of which, this is the Northwest Sanitarium, otherwise known as the Eisenbeis Hotel. Or maybe it's Eisenbeis. I'm going with Eisenbeis. I don't know. Uh, so this is said to have been built in 1890 by Charles Eisenbeis on the bluff above what is now the Boat Haven Marina. Charles Eisenbeis who died in 1902, was a Prussian immigrant. He operated several businesses that served the Boomtown's mill workers, including a brewery, a bakery, a brick factory, a lumber mill, and a hotel. Due to his social standing, Charles Eisenbeis was elected Port Townsend's first mayor in 1878. Now this building was built to serve as a hotel where the railroad stopped, but as you'll recall, the railroad was never built. This building is all of 175 rooms, and it was reported in the Port Townsend Leader uh, many decades later that it burned down by arson in 1923. The spectacular blaze that erased one of the city's most prominent landmarks and notable buildings was declared to be of incendiary origin probably set by a pyromaniac who is now credited with several blazes within a few weeks. I absolutely love these photographs. I've said this before. They came up in Seattle where you have these really prominent, marvelous old world buildings in the middle of 
seemingly nowhere. Now, if you want to know what a sanitarium is, uh, here's a brochure of the time. And basically, it's a hotel. It says it's a first-class hotel together with advantages of modern scientifically equipped hospital. So there you have it. It's a place to go and have whatever ills you healed. Now, as if it wasn't enough to have a sanitarium, you also have St. John's Hospital being built at precisely the same time. According to a report, lists of significant buildings erected during Port Townsend's 1888 to 1891 building boom often omit St. John's Hospital, and that's a shame because what a building. It was one of the first structures built overlooking the city on what is now Castle Hill. So, you know, again, and this building here, the St. John's Hospital, is attributed to none other than Charles Eisenbeis, first mayor and builder of the Northwest Sanitarium. He was a very, very busy fellow, but we're not done yet with Charles Eisenbeis. Uh, this building was donated to the Sisters of Charity of Providence. Now, think back to the Seattle videos or go take a look at them. Providence Hospital was designed and built by, if you recall, Mother Joseph. Now, Mother Joseph appears here again because it is said that she is responsible for the operation, the maintenance of this St. John's Hospital. Now, a busy, busy woman she was. It is said that she learned carpentry and design skills in the workshop of her father, who was a Montreal woodworker, designer, and carriage maker. She began to design and build needed schools and hospitals in the Pacific Northwest. I wonder why we don't know more about Mother Joseph, and I do think she was a real character. That she's responsible for what they attribute to her is very questionable, but she does seem to be a remarkable woman. Here we have St. John's Hospital, and this is the Manresa Castle, which we're about to get to. Um, but again, this shows what these areas look like out here in the remote Pacific Northwest in the early days, and who knows when these photographs we're actually from. We've seen time and again already that photos are misattributed with dates that just don't match up. Buildings that have dates that don't match photos and historic societies and vice versa. Over and over again. So St. John's Hospital built at the same time by the same person as the Eisenbeis Sanitarium and built at the same time as the Jefferson County Courthouse with its one and a half million pounds of sandstone that was brought down from Alaska and dragged up the hill from the port 200 feet in elevation. All of this happening at the same time. Now I know I sound like a broken record, but there's 4,500 people in town in 1890 and they still had to have built the entire downtown that we just went through in parts one and two. This some, something's, something's not making sense. Now moving along, we have the Lincoln School. Now the Lincoln School, it is said, was built in 1892. It was considered the finest schoolhouse in the state. It was modified twice. First, would you believe it? The towers were removed in 1937 due to storm damage. Where have we heard that before? The tower and the architectural embellishments were removed along with much of the structure itself. This photograph is from 1916, I believe, and it looks all but abandoned already. But who knows? I'm sure it's had many lives and many iterations. One more picture of it in its full glory. So, okay, here again, the Lincoln School and the sanitarium back here and this must be st john's or vice versa these are just extraordinary buildings isn't this interesting here how the land is just tapered up or down where it's kind of mounded up around the base of this building and or carved out I found this to be really interesting like this it's like the building was here and then whatever was around it was denuded i told you i was hesitant to show you what the lincoln school looks like today and i can't tell if i wish they just finished knocking this down or um, applaud them for keeping at least this much because maybe it can be i don't know this is where the tower was i've looked at this you know side by side comparison of what was here you see these banks of windows and these gable roofs and the tower and this grand entry and then we come back to this and 
Maybe this is the back side and that was the front side. It doesn't matter. Pretty sure there was a tower right here. And you see this where they take towers down. You know, there's a war on towers. That is for sure. <laughs> Why strip out all of the um, of the architecture and, and leave this much? Maybe maybe they just wanted it for its function of uh, interior space. Said I was saving the best for the last and here we are. The Manresa Castle. A little bit about the Manresa Castle from the hotel website. It is still being run as a hotel. Uh, the castle was completed in 1892, which means it was being built before that time in 1890, 1891, while everything else was being built around town. In keeping with his status in the community, Charles Eisenbeis built what was the largest private residence ever built in Port Townsend, consisting of 30 rooms for himself and his lovely wife Kate. The walls were 12 inches thick made with bricks from Eisenbeiss's own brickworks and the roof was slate. Tiled fireplaces and finely crafted woodwork were installed by German artisans. Presumably these were German artisans not preoccupied with building the rest of downtown or any of the other palaces that we have just seen. Poor Charles died in 1902. Castle was left empty for almost 20 years, except for a caretaker. Interestingly, uh, it was bought by Seattle nuns in 1925, and that didn't work out, so Jesuit priests took it over two years later and used it as a retreat for themselves. And here we have another view. Sadly for the Eisenbeises, their son shot himself in the head in this castle in 1897 and left Mr. Eisenbeis and Mrs. Eisenbeis quite despondent. There is also a report of a monk having hung himself in the castle's attic and to this day people report that they can still hear footsteps of the monk in the attic. Now here is the Manresa castle in the background, otherwise known as the Eisenbeis castle. Named Manresa after the monastery in Spain uh, that the Jesuit monks came from. Here is St. John's Hospital. One last look at the Manresa Castle. And if you like, you can spend a night there amongst the ghosts of Port Townsend Past. Now before we wrap up, I would be remiss not to include the Post Office and Customs House, reportedly constructed in 1893. Quite a formidable structure, very strange windows once again at or below the street level. Here it is overlooking the bluff. And as with so many of the historic structures in Port Townsend, it is currently being given a facelift. And there you have it. And here with this photograph from 1893, we are going to wrap up our exploration of Port Townsend, 1893. A mere 15 years after E.S. Glover produced his 1878 survey drawing of this nascent, remote Victorian village lifting itself up out of the wilderness and somehow finding the means to produce a full-blown provincial city in this remote location at this early time period and perhaps the crafters of our history the narrative makers and the spellcasters would have succeeded if it hadn't been for us meddling kids marvelous old world signing off <laughs>